Um, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful introduction, especially uh, the professor part. Um, thank you, uh, ILA, for uh, organizing this event in our town. I hope you have a good time and that everything is successful for you here. And uh, <laughs> Okay, I'm going to start with my lecture today. and. Um, my uh, topic of my lecture is the fifth form of light. Uh, I will begin with uh, a kind of uh, philosophical phrase which applies not only to my profession, but it applies to life in general. Because everything we do today, uh, we should really think in a holistic manner because whatever we do, uh, and we avoid the reality of what we do, it's probably going to happen that we're not going to be able to avoid the consequences of that reality. Uh, then another slide that I will show you may seem to have nothing to do with my lecture today, but it has almost everything to do because uh, it tells us how insignificant we are in our short stay on this planet. But we do have a great influence on it, and uh, we do have a possibility of making not only our lives, but everybody else better. Uh, we can discuss about this image later if you want, because there is a lot of other topics behind it. Another thing for my guests here from all over the world is something that you probably didn't know, and that is that uh, the first fully functional power plant on the planet was actually built in Croatia near Šibenik. And that's something that I also learned from Professor Kreitzer sitting here in this room, which I didn't know before, and that happened before the Niagara Falls. Fully functional means that it, the, the electric energy was produced, it was distributed, and then used. So we were the first, and of course, you know who invented all this. Another thing happened pretty much at the same time, and that is that the first... Uh, lighting, street lighting with incandescent bulbs was turned on just for one night in Newcastle and that apparently is the first ever um, public lighting that was functional in the world. Then about 100 years after that we learned and that uh, public lighting, street lighting, and everything that is within the urban realm is something that we use every day very naturally. It's something that we use like, you know, water, like air, like everything else. But the fact is that we screwed up a little bit and then we are overdoing it at certain, certain occasions. The reason why I want to talk about this topic today, like my friend Mark Major would say, we can talk about issues or we can talk about projects. Well, today I'm going to talk about issues more than projects. So the issue here is that uh, we're generating uh, certain negative aspects of all that throughout the time we call light pollution. I personally don't like the word pollution, and all the lighting uh, pollution activists know very well that I hate that word because uh, you know, pollution for me is something that you can right away smell, that you can see something dirty, and with light, it is completely different. So I don't like to use it because then if somebody asks me, what do you do for a living, you know, I would say I'm in pollution business, but I'm not. So then about 20 years later, when we started talking about light pollution, some voices are raised and we are demanding dark. You know, the right to dark is something that we should really, really think very thoroughly about it. Because this image here is showing a, a recent image from Caracas in Venezuela, where you know all what's happening, and they lost the power in the entire city. So, uh, but that doesn't really apply only to third world countries on the brink of a civil war. This particular image, and this was published in New York Times, uh, was from Highland Park, Michigan, United States, where the mayor, in order to save energy, decided that he will leave on only every fourth light fitting on the pole on the street. And then you have the local priest who came out of the church, and this is his comment. So he was very, very upset about that. And not having light is also as much problem as having too much light. So this image also represents Caracas, where people 
would like to stay outdoors, and we are used to stay outdoors. Sometimes during the summer season in here, for example, people stay outdoors all night. And they, you know, used, found a generator, put this one light there and enjoyed having any kind of light, even if this is a completely wrong light. So if we want to talk about the anatomy of visual experience, we can divide that in some, you know, basic aspects, which is, you know, we need the light to be able to see. But then we can also go in, in the deeper, which I think this conference is all about, and I'm not going to talk about this because I know that every single uh, speaker here has thought and knows about that much more than me. So when we talk about basics, we know that security is one, visual orientation, spatial orientation, there is something that we never really talk about or rarely talk about, and that is owner's pride. When I say owner's pride, I mean when you have a good project realized in a town, in a city, the owners, which are the citizens of that town, take certain pride of that. The biggest uh, uh, such event in my personal experience is the lighting giants in Pula and also the Bosper Tunnel, where the owners, the citizens who use that tunnel are very proud of that, and I know that the proud uh, citizens, of my citizens here in Pula, are very proud of the lighting giants. That HSCL there means human-centric lighting. Human-centric lighting, for me, is a little bit strange phrase. It's a little bit strange because all electric lighting is for humans. So when we talk about human-centric, I assume that we are talking about something else, not just the basic utilitarian lighting. What we are talking about, maybe, is that the light has a very strong emotional aspect of our biological, uh, in, our, in our life. We have so many scientific experiments, and so many scientific proofs about the benefits and we also have the scientific proof about negative aspects of wrong lighting to the human beings. There's the one thing that I discovered recently on a Discovery Channel, of course, when I was looking at this documentary, is that we actually have a second brain. A second brain which is positioned in our stomach, because they discovered that 85% of serotonin is actually generated in our stomach, and it takes two nanoseconds from there the emotion that was created in our stomach takes two nanoseconds to reach our brain. And then we start to reason, and then we definitely screw up. Because if we would listen to our emotions first, then I guess we would feel a lot better. So, I feel, therefore I am. And then the fact is that there is absolutely no public investment in any way about the education of people regarding the quality light. It doesn't exist. The only criteria about public lighting, if it's not decorative or artistic lighting, is a price, or it is watts per uh, lumens. So that is the only criteria why are we using some lighting in a, in a, in a public space. So Peter Eisman, a very famous architect and we can also say philosopher once said that 90% of the buildings on the planet are not architecture, but they are necessary. So if that's true, that means that 99.9% .9 of lighting on this planet is not designed or planned. And it's not really all necessary. That is my personal opinion. So that is why we have, by generating something that we call light pollution, which I prefer to call lighting noise because sound also, that it's not visible, it doesn't have a smell, just like light, but it does create annoyance, and also a wrong light creates annoyance. So, light noise or light pollution, I think it's something that should be in the hands and the authority of people who are really involved professionally in lighting profession. Having, being a lighting professional, it takes a very, different approach towards this problem than not understanding what real light is all about. Because the definition that you can find on Wikipedia about this problem, and if you take out everything else, but just leave the words that describe these problems, I don't think you can find any serious professional lighting designer or anyone, a lighting engineer, who is willingly going to do something like that. So, 
how can we describe our job? You know, we can describe it in a funny way. So this sounds very funny to a lot of people because someone who solves a problem you didn't know you have in a way you don't understand. But it's not funny because the part that says you didn't know you had actually applies to everything that I said before. And because we don't know that we have this problem, that is why there is no investment, public awareness, except we are talking to each other on conferences like this. Because in this conference, everybody who was talking about light is involved in light and knows something about it. In my conferences, professional, when I, when I take to PLDC, ILD, and all the professional conferences throughout the world, I'm talking to lighting designers. So I'm actually talking to my competitors. And we all know what lighting is all about, and we are practically convincing each other how important lighting is. But for those who don't know what that is, you know, I can describe that through a simple graph that describes the basics of light. Light is electromagnetic uh, frequency, a visible part of electromagnetic frequencies. And if I only change the words in this graph, that can describe what my personal what my job is and who I have to deal with. I have to deal with a lot of different things in order to perform my job. I have to deal with norms, with budgets, politics, culture, sustainability, environment, efficiency, and so on and so on. Through my dealings with this, I have to deal with investors, architects, electrical engineers, interior designers, HVAC, and so on and so on. So, a true lighting design profession is a very complex and very serious profession, which is a creative process directly connected within context of time, space, technology, and culture. And we are not activists. We are active participants, which means that what we are going to propose and do if we are true active participants is not going to be something that will hurt anyone. And also, what we are doing, actually, is we are not doing this for architecture. We are not doing this for buildings, for the streets. We are doing this for people, because architecture doesn't care about lighting. You know, the brick doesn't care if it's lit or not, but we do. So, if we want to summarize our job, we are actually working on the basis of empathy, because whatever, whatever we do, it's based on something that we share with other human beings. We need to realize that we, that we can talk about ecology or ecology without economy. The economy should be the base of having the right ecology in the future. The right uh, example is that you try to imagine in the third world countries how much they have time or funds to think about ecology if they are starving, you know. So this is, see, all right. Hope he gets well. So anyway, to continue, <coughs> ecology and economy is something that, in my opinion, it works very much together. And uh, the problem that we have today is that the basic principle of public lighting today didn't change since 19th century. It's pretty much the same. So just recently, Just recently, we started talking about smart lighting in the cities. Actually, we're talking about smart cities in general. And, um, and we are talking about implementing all these new technologies that are available today in order to have something that we call smart. Well, my problem with that is that the light in this particular case is in the shadow of technology. Because when you read the specification of the light fitting for a town today, there is everything in it except the part that talks about the actual quality of the light itself. So we're talking about the IoT, Internet of Things that we can add to the light fitting, the sensors and all kinds of different things but we are rarely talking about the quality of the actual light that will come out of that light fitting. So, I have a proposal of how can we have uh, a sustainable and adaptive lighting design strategy for the 21st century. A starting point should be maybe, can we see when do we need the light and where do we need it and why do we need it at all? 
because this graph, graph represents the difference between seasonal changes and seasonal use of the light in this particular area, where we can say that this applies to all Mediterranean countries. If you go up north, then it's a completely different story because they have six months of night and six months of day practically. So it's a completely different thing. So we cannot have a universal uh, criteria for all parts of the world. So see here, for example, this represents the public lighting and it's always on. This here represents uh, the human activity. I'm sorry, no, this red is a human activity. It's different. And then this represents the day. So as you can see, we have a very short night during the summer, but we have a very intensive human activity during the night, which is the opposite of the winter. In the winter, we have a very long night, but we have practically no human activity after certain hour especially in the small tourist towns like Pula and the entire Croatian coast. And I believe that applies to all tourist resorts and Mediterranean towns and cities. So if you look at the image, this particular image is our town, you know, a, a, a broader part of our town of Pula. When you turn on the lights, they stay on all night and that's, that's the way it is every night. So what if we have this smart dynamic system which actually knows how many people are on the given street at certain time of the night, and then provides enough light for that person who is in his, near his house, or he's walking towards somewhere, and then if he's home and there's nobody on the street, then there is no light or there's minimal light. In this manner, we can save enormous amount of energy, as you can see here, and then we can also very much reduce drastically uh, the energy consumption and naturally we can then re reduce the uh, impact of the environment. That methodology we call uh, topographic methodology. Why? Because we can't look at the lighting system today as a one fitting or one street lighting. We have to look at it as a dynamic grid. Dynamic grid where all the system works in a controllable way altogether according to certain conditions. So not every night is a full moon, not every night is raining, not every night is a snow, not every night we have, you know, Visualia, a, a light festival, or something where we're gonna have a lot of people on the street. So every night is different, conditions are different. So if we have different conditions, why can't we adjust the light with technology that is available today and the knowledge that is available according to these certain conditions that's how we can create the light topography. Light topography meaning that light can be warm or cold, or it can be intense, or it can be dimmed. These are at least four basic principles. If we add to that also that the color reproduction of those fittings is a high quality, then we have a very good quality lighting. So basically for the 21st century, we need to think about beyond what we have today, you know, to put the light at the right light, you know, in the right place, when and where we need it. For that particular purpose, I did an experiment. Uh, my Pulejanos here, they know what Motovun is and whatever, maybe our guests international don't know. So I'm gonna show you a project which I took as an experiment to see if there is a way and what is going to be the reaction of all participants into this if we try to create that kind of system. So Motovun is a very cute little town in the middle of Istria. If you didn't visit it, you should because it's really nice. Uh, it's a small town on top of the hill and it's famous for truffles and good food and nice sunsets. Uh, it's also famous because Mario Andretti was born there, you know, the Formula One driver. And Andrea Antico who invented music notes and also the Joseph Russell who invented the propeller, and those are the interesting few people who actually lived or are born in Motovun. The particularity of this project is that you can see this town from all four sides. And uh, all four sides are different, and every one of them is interesting in a particular way. But during the night, you can't really understand the form and the features of this town because the light is uh, completely wrong. If you go inside, there's a really nice, cute restaurants and bars and so on, but you are sitting under this 
thing here or near this thing, you can't really enjoy anything that is around you because you have this very glary fittings. Also, <clears throat> if you try to enjoy your sunset sitting here, you probably can't because you have very closely here those very bright fittings. And throughout the town, as you walk around, it's always like that. There is a famous film festival which is held every year. Thousands of people visit and they actually sleep on the floors and everywhere because it's a quite a big event which lasts for a week, I think, or something like that. So anyway, I was asked uh, by the mayor to come up with some kind of solution that we illuminate the medieval city walls and the church tower. So once we started working on this, we realized that if we do this, we cannot ever have the complete picture of this beautiful town during the night. And because that town is very picturesque and the matrix, the urban matrix of that town is very uh, three-dimensional. So it goes vertically and goes horizontally. So you can actually control your view if you are considering illuminating the entire place. So we said, okay, uh, we have designed our Polesano pole here, which have many movable heads. So let's say that we just illuminate at least the part when you are driving because there's a very nice natural landscapes around. And uh, this picture, when we tried it, it didn't really work. So I, I wasn't happy with that. So I had this experimental itch, which I said, why wouldn't we take this entire town and treat it as a painting? So let's see if we can take a completely different approach towards illuminating this. And let's see if we can have a much broader picture around this project, and then we will propose it if it works. So we actually laser scanned the entire town, made a 3D model of it. And because architectural lighting is always site-specific, we had to take it part by part. So we took it apart, we analyzed all different features of that visual image that you have. We even consider the roofs and the private facades and public facades and city walls and, and graveyard and the walls around the graveyard and landscape and all this. And then we said, okay, let's analyze this through our methodology and see what can we come up with where we actually define the architectural typologies on one hand, we had the connective tissue that connects everything together. And then let's see what is the visual experience that we want to achieve taking into account landscape relation, object contours, neighbor relation, and then the atmosphere that we want to achieve. So once we dissected all this anatomically, then we started sketching and said, okay, let's try it with hand first. See, how can we come up with this image considering all the factors that I showed you before? The first renderings were great. You know, we liked it very much and it looks very cozy. I wasn't at the time at all uh, concerned about any issues except let's do something that is going to be very visually appealing and something that would actually br bring people to that place just to see that. Because Ottobon is a place that cannot do any investments there. They cannot build anything. It is completely protected by the agency and uh, the only thing you can do actually you can invest in a lighting system which will be an economic investment, not just a visual investment. So when we started doing this, everything was fine and I liked this image. And uh, you can see here how the renderings came out to. All of it was done just like one image, including the graveyard here. Okay. All right, so you've seen it now. And this is the picture during the day, and this is the picture during the night. But this project is not about these images that I showed you. This project is about something completely different. That something different lies in this sentence here, that we live today in an accelerated obsolescence, which means that no matter what you see today, you don't want to see it tomorrow again because it's boring for you. We also need to have systems that will be different today, tomorrow, after tomorrow, and so on. We need a system that will actually consider all aspects of potential environmental, energy, uh, private, public, and so on, and so on. So we actually created a system that is completely dynamic, a 
system that is completely controllable. So imagine if it's a rainy day and you only have illuminating the roof and you can see the water playing on those roofs and nothing else. Or if it's a full moon, you enhance the image of the full moons throughout the whole town. Or when there's nobody, it's a dead season or it's cold, you shut everything off. So basically, you can have this system work five minutes every night, 10 minutes once a week, or you can have it you know, in a particular day whenever you want. So you basically have complete control in your hands about this system. When I presented this project, the light pollution activists saw that image before and there was huge criticism about this. And that is because they have absolutely no clue what this project is all about. This project is an experiment that wants to show that we can have a lot of light when we want it and we can have no light when we don't need it and we can actually have an economic benefit throughout this process of, of that kind of investment. So this particular dynamic approach considers all aspects of visual environmental long-term economic with exception of initial budget. This is something that we absolutely didn't think about. And then we have a few words that we have to consider during this process. That's complexity, contradiction, consequence, and creativity. Complexity on projects like this relies in politics, power company, of course, the activists, private involvement, money, and all this and all this. And we are very, very aware of that. It's not easy. Contradiction. Contradiction is that we, lighting designers, we creators, however you want to call it, we know and we are well aware of all these pro pro potential problems and difficulties about this. And uh, we are just trying to improve the urban image and create this economic and visual benefit for the people that live there and reduce the environmental impact, which is, of course, the paradox. So, how can we resolve? We can resolve this, as I was saying before and showed the graph, by having a dynamic lighting system based on conditional logic, where we have every night a different scene, a different image, a different thing in our, in our view. So who is judging our work? You know, our work is usually public realm. So anything that is public is subject to a subjective interpretation of whoever, but I can tell you that we are the worst judges of our work because we know everything, all the particular parts of our job. In this particular job, it was the mayor who was the judge. So I told the mayor, I said, look, I have this really crazy idea about how we can approach this and I don't think you should show this to your uh, the city council or whatever maybe you should see it first and then if you think it's too crazy maybe we're not going to go that far because this is so expensive and so difficult in technologically and so on that maybe it doesn't even make sense to show it and he said no no it's okay so we went there and everybody was there you know everybody the electrical guy the tourist board people the garbage guy, everybody was there. So I said, okay. So I started, you know, preparing myself and see what's gonna happen because, you know, 10 people, 10 different opinions. So <clears throat> I was really afraid they're gonna jump on me, but that's where the fifth form of light came in to the picture. And you know that the light lives in five forms. One is the form of the source, one that generates the light. The other one is the form of the light itself. Light is invisible, but it does have a form. And that form actually reveals the object which is illuminated. And then we have the fourth, which is a shadow, which is as important as the light itself, because if there is no shadow, there is no third dimension of the space. And the most important one, which is the fifth, is the form of consequence. And that is the most important form of light. The consequence about this presentation, about this project, on that meeting, was that they are convincing me that they should go ahead with it. 
and I try to explain to them how difficult and expensive it is, they say, no, this is great because this is going to be unique, it's going to bring a lot of people, we're going to have four seasons because this can work you know, during the summer, winter and so on, the real estate price will rise and this is definitely going to be rebranding and international recognition because this has never been done before. So, technology today allows us really to do things that were unthinkable just recently. We have the technology, we have the knowledge. What we don't have is a lack of constructive dialogue between all the parties involved. And all the parties involved are actually the people. So, the manufacturing community, which we have a representative here, environmental and social and so on and so on, so sh should sit down and talk. So, instead of, you know, treating any issues like this, maybe they should just get together and try to resolve the problem. Because at the end of the day, we are all talking about the same thing. We're just using this, the different languages, if I could say. And there is only one way that only together we, should, we can rethink the fundamental principles of public lighting functionality. And then, after all this, we need to be very creative. Because we, if we want to step out of the usual way of doing things, we really need to be creative. Because if you divide and talk about creativity or the process of lighting design in one meter, in that one meter you have the subject, and these are all the people that are involved. You have the object, like that town or sculpture or lighting giants or roundabout here in Pula. Then you have laws and regulations and norms and so on. Then you have the problem of realization with electricians and so on and so on and so on. Somewhere in that meter, there is this critical creative centimeter that makes the difference between utilitarian and beyond. Because unless life also hands you sugar and water, your lemonade is going to suck. That's it. So thank you very much.